Today we'll be hearing from Chuck Dexter, who is a staff scientist at the OS. And, uh, you know, we, we, uh, especially in the SDR world, we uh, talk a lot about um, uh, the digital area of things and, and a lot, obviously, a lot about uh, software. Uh, what Chuck's going to talk about is the other critical component of uh, software fine radio that sometimes we take for granted, uh, which is the, the RF, uh, especially the, the bits between the AC and the actual antenna that makes it a radio. Uh, so, with further ado, I'll uh, bring Chuck up here and uh, get going. So, 
hopefully some of you know what stress factor is. Stress factor is how do you calculate the total power? That is, if you had 10 signals of a certain amplitude, about the same amplitude, then their actual average power would be 10 log number signals, or in this case, 10 would be 10 dB. 100 signals would be another 20 dB. But now, that is just the average power. The peak statistical power you can look at as just waves of motion. So when waves clash together, it can make peaks. The same thing happens as you uh, take many signals, there'll be phase and amplitude that will cause peaks. And these peaks to be another 10 dB beyond. Or you can have what we call statistical peaks that you have to watch out for, and it will be 15 log the number of signals. So it's like a choir with only one singer versus choir with 100 signals. 100 singers, and that would give you a, uh, a 20 dB increase in the volume, but your peaks would be possibly 40 dB higher than that. So what does that mean for regular signals? So I'm showing you here in the bottom left, 10 simple signals, their FM signal. Their average power is 10 dB higher. But the statistical peak would be another 10 dB. And then look on the, the right. We're looking at a standard digital TV signal, 64 amps, maybe 4 megasamps per second, uh, similarly. Uh, it actually has an average power plus its statistical peak is over 15 dB higher. Again, if you're looking at millions of signals within this band, and they can peak up 15 dB higher. So that as you look into new broadband radio, of course, the IS over 100 megahertz wide or so, uh, and then you look and try to set the algorithm to pull the gain of the receiver down a little bit, so that you're not looking, you have to keep in mind that your statistical peaks may be off screen or exceeding the ABC full scale. You guys know what happens when your signal exceeds the ABC full scale. You get garbage out. So what in them, you pull, have to pull this power down so that this, you have 10 to 15 dB of headroom on the signals. However, what happens to signals outside the band? You can't see them. So you're sitting there looking at a little signal, but outside your bandwidth is hundreds of bigger signals. The ADC is absolutely blind to these signals. And what you can't see can hurt you. So I'm going to go into how you simulate the band. And is, you can take a spectrum analyzer and just tune all the way through a thousand megahertz or so and start adding up all these signals. And this is the way you do it. In this case, we're talking about downtown Chicago, and we're going to talk about the FM stations and the uh, TV stations, some other signals, and we just take the DBM converted to milliwatts, add up the milliwatts, turn it back to DBM, and then add the 10 log that and the statistical power. In the case of the Chicago area, the statistical peak over 7 dBm. 7 dBm would actually crush most radios. That's a lot of so You would actually take a power meter and put it right on your antenna and you're going to measure the average power. The peak power will then be another 10 dB beyond that. Now, there's a lot of other signals in there. There's a half a dozen cell towers in the area. In our DRS uh, place in Germantown, we are probably 600 feet away from a, a tower. So we measured this, the power of these cell towers and all these signals to about minus 33 dBm. And 
between 852 to 864 megahertz, about 22 megahertz then. We, we see all the cell towers. Now, we think they're all TDMA signals, so they're all spaced 200 kilohertz apart. So you can say, oh, there's at least 110 channels simultaneously going on there. If 80% of them are occupied, that means that the average plus the little peaks are almost 30 dB, 30 dB above that. So at the antenna, just that band of cell signals is minus 3.8 dB. And that's just one cell band. So we put up a, uh, a nice antenna on top of the roof of the URS building just see what we're getting there. And this is a measurement of everything going on in the German town there on uh, the antenna band, the TV band, and the cell tower band. We're almost zero dB. For the arrow pointing is the uh, cell band is next to us. The to the right, I'm sorry, to the left, the highest signal there that the, the FM signals in between with all the TV signals. So the real world really is Google. But on the data sheet of any radio, all you see is something called third order intercept point, second order intercept point, and noise figure. They pretty much represent what the dynamic range of receiver. But that's tested with only two signals, not the hundreds or thousands of signals you see on your antenna, just two signals. So what I'm suggesting as we get more and more into wideband uh, bandwidths where you see hundreds of signals in your passband and then thousands of signals outside your passband, you may want another way of measuring these signals. <coughs> so just as a reminder for all of you of uh, what IP2 and IP3 mean, I'm going to talk about IM2s and IM3s. They're just the results of IP2 and IP3. If you put any signal into a radio, or any part of the radio, and you increase that signal up, you'll see an output that also increases up. But it only increases up until it hits the so-called P1 dB point. That's the point which that uh, device can no longer handle that signal. It's just going to zero out or limit itself. But way before that, you'll see a second harmonic and a third harmonic. The second harmonic, as you see in the screen, will be the, uh, the green line. For every one dB increase in signal level, the second order will come up two dB. And on the red line, you see that's the third order, inter the third order plus will start coming up. And they will go up every one dB increase in input will cause a 3 dB change in the output. But when it gets, and, and then you notice these little dotted lines, they will then intersect your normal line that would increase if you had done it, tremendous dynamic range, because you don't. So you have something called the IP3 point and an IP2 point. There's a second, third order. So they represent pretty much the dynamic range. And then when they hit the mixer, you really use a two-tone effect, which I won't go into now. But they deal with the harmonics of the RF and the harmonics of the LR. Now, does this test, that's a single signal, a two-signal test, represent the real world? No. So I'm going to introduce you to something that's been going on for 75 years. It's called noise power ratio measurements. So instead of just Two signals define your dynamic range. Here we tune the radio into the notch. We take out the noise, put it through a low pass filter, then a notch, and then a high pass notch in the tuner, so that as we move, we can move the notch around and we can put the tuner inside the notch. And then we raise the noise up. We raise the noise up until the notch fills the noise. If the notch comes up 3 dB, we stop to measure what is your power of the noise outside, this creating this intermodulation inside. So this noise represents the many thousands of signals on the antenna, and therefore 
you can use this test on one radio compared to another radio or anywhere in the world. The telephone companies have been doing this for years. So what causes oops? Hmm. Okay. What I'm going to demonstrate uh, today would be a simple test that you can do on an antenna in your facility without having an NPR test set. And then if you really want to, I'll show you how to roll your own really power test set. It's not very difficult. The first is you put your radio on an antenna, but you put a step attenuator between the antenna and the power splitter and the power combiner here and a signal generator. So you can put a signal of interest and you tune the radio to a blank spot on spectrum. And you'll notice you've got a quantity signal and you've got some other signals you're not sure of. But what you do is you drop, you can drop the power into the radio by 3 dB. You want a signal and all these other signals should drop 3 dB. If they don't, they drop 6 dB. There's second order products for the IM2. If they drop 9 dB, there are third order products, IM3s. But that doesn't represent the real world. There's a couple of cases where you can have the fundamental coming in, but a harmonic of the uh, and of the LO. Harmonics of the LO can also be a problem because they will also create, especially in the zero life radio, they'll create another response. So in this case, you go down to the bottom where it says frequency test for real signals. As you're looking at the FFT, you can move it. You can tune the radio 10% of the bandwidth, or I'd like say, a couple of megahertz. And then you'll see the signal of interest move two megahertz. But if you see any of the signals moving four megahertz, that's IM2. If you see them moving uh, uh, six megahertz, they're IM3. And that's all, that will catch the fundamental of the RF times harmonics of the second. So the, the, net, the last test was actually more thorough, but you'll have to be more careful watching these signals. Now, if you want to roll your own noise power ratio test, we take a simple high value resistor, amplify this noise, and amplify it, put a attenuator in and find the power amplifier. Because this is a lot of noise. You're going to be belching out something like plus 10 dB with the noise. And none of these amplifiers can limit. Otherwise, you're cutting down your peaks. So then you switch in different notches. I think we're going to test that, simple test that, about 50 megahertz, 200 megahertz, and 800 megahertz. And you take the two radios you're trying to compare, as unit one, unit two, you put a, a signal in the notch, and instead of raising your noise with your attenuator, you're just taking out, I mean, you're taking out more and more attenuation, so the signal power is going up. And then as soon as you see, a 3 dB degradation of the signal noise ratio, and you take the notch out and measure the actual power of the radio, and that's going to be the signal to noise ratio. The bigger, the better. So, what falls in this notch? All the nonlinear portions of the radio, every from from the AC all the way to the front end, the mixers and everything. And it'll show up all the second order responses, the IF responses, image responses, third orders, any and all second orders, the cyclical mix of the low oscillator, and, uh, and all your end content spurs in the mixture. Now, let's go through the super headlines architecture. We put in a pre-selector in front of preempt to protect in the second order, and also protects the mixer against second order. But notice the image, as you would notice at the top diagram, the LO is above the RF, and so therefore the image 
is higher than the oral, and it's easy to get rid of. So we want the eye. In the case of the transmitter, then there all the umpires turn around. Instead of the tuner, now it's called the ring up. Tuner backwards. For the zero ions, in this case, any RF signal come in like 100 megahertz, say, the LO signal uh, synthesizer will also get 100 megahertz. But they'll also have 200, 300, 400 megahertz harmonics there, and you get responses. So what you want is the signal on the right in the diagram, the signal you do not want on the left is the unsuppressed quadrature energy. In most cases, it's about 20 or 30 dB down. In the transmitter's case, you're actually broadcasting this image. So pros and cons. Super heads, yes, they're higher complexity, larger size, possibly higher they have higher costs and may have higher power. But they have absolutely great dynamic range with very, very low image response and spurious responses. The zero IF, it has the lowest cost, uh, but it has all the attributes you see on the, the right side, including an image problem and secondary sorption and then responses to the LO harmonics. But every radio that made can also be improved by putting in pre-selection to reduce these out of band interference. So the first number one is just put in a low pass filter. Now the preamp will give you a second and third order uh, problems with all the signals you see. So we put in the tracking pre-selector, number two. And uh, tracking pre-selector do a really good job, but they're kind of lossy, so you know you should those up. The best possible pre-selection you can put in the radio is Sabaki pre-selectors. Sabaki meaning they'll never get an IM3 product through there because they're so narrow. However, as they narrow up, you have problems getting the wide bandwidth through there. So they're higher costs and take up more PC board real estate. So these are all the issues we need to consider. The cost, our environment, the spur signals, and performance. The zero IF is perfect for situations where you put a pre-selector in and you don't tune anything. Now you can control your environment. But if you're going to tune over a wide piece of the spectrum, then possibly the uh, super heck will do better. But the main thing is performance. It's very difficult to turn the metrics of good enough to let you understand what's on your antenna. And knowledge is key. So, here we have two spectrums, and this is how far I'm kind of gauge broke. I tuned to 300 megahertz because it just happened to be a dead spot on the band, and put it into a super heavy ion receiver and a zero IF receiver. Which is which? Any guesses? Super heavy on the right. The one on the right is what? Good. I'll pay you off later. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, the zero IF receiver was taking the second harmonic of the FM band, and every time it puts your talk signal, it go off somewhere around our area, about 433 megahertz. It would fold and mix back the FM, second order of the FM spectrum right into this band. So I can tell by just dropping the signal on the antenna by 3 dB, these bird drop steps. Or the super hat then represented the signal. So you can tell if you're looking around for the signal of interest, you can only find it in the zero IF. So in conclusion, the new radio provides a framework for very dense RF applications, including specialized higher performance design. But in high density signal line super hats, Transceivers have a much higher dynamic range, fewer ions per and they broadcast far less signals that are out of hand. Both zero and I have super heads absolutely need pre selection to get rid of the total number of signals. In a low signal density environment, the zero I have probably is okay, but I still recommend some kind of.
and then have filter in the front of it. So you see that the on gear test ion intermodulation is easy, but it's difficult to quantify. I can't take whatever I run there and take it to another site and say, okay, it's going to perform this way. So I'm suggesting using the noise power ratio test will give us a, a measure of the dynamic range of receiver in the real signal environment. And BRS is going to be testing the next few months our radio against everybody else's radio on noise power ratio. And if things work out, you'll see the results maybe at our open house symposium in October. So thank you very much. So we have a few minutes. Uh, does anybody in the audience have questions? Yes. Yeah, it's one of the being on the Yeah, in the uh, HF amateur radio world, there seems to be a, a contest going on for clear over dynamic range between direct sampling of flex radio and uh, at least double or triple conversion of the light craft. And they're all about 109 uh, uh, dB. Is that hitting a plateau? And is it going to get any better? Or uh, in which technology is, uh, has more problems in the future? Well, in my experience, I've seen uh, 140 dB between the smallest signal in the HF band and the highest signal. Uh, the highest signal reported on anybody's HF antenna is in plus, I'm uh, sorry, minus 5 dB in the signal. At the same time, you're able to capture narrowband signals by maybe minus 130 dB. So you see, you have a huge dynamic range problem. And so we've been making HF radios a long time. And uh, we expect that you need at least plus 45 third order and maybe plus 80 second order in order to handle the HF spectrum. If your HF radio can't do that, you better make a very short antenna. We have another couple minutes. Any further questions from the audience? Is it possible to get those slides that you uh so all of the slides, uh, and PR is, is submitting the slides uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so all, all of the slides that have been um, uh, you know, authorized by the authors of the will be posted on the Good Radio website. And uh, at some point in the future, once we get through processing all the videos, so we'll be recording. I'm looking at the website right now. It says slide NA. Maybe there's a different... Uh, no, we, 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 haven't, we haven't gotten everything yet. Yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll, 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 we've got a couple. Just, uh, if you, if you reload, Chuck's slide should be up already. Yeah,